My dad was a pharmaceutical sales rep and he loved any kind of content that would help him get better. His office was actually in our basement. And whenever I'd go down and see him, I'd see Zig Ziglar books stacked on his desk, right? See you at the top, born to win, secrets of closing a sale, all stacked up. And, and you know, you remember Zig, right? I mean, he, he was the godfather of motivational speaking. He, he was one of the first, he was, he was one of the best. At 20, I decided I have got to find a way to meet this incredible man. I, I think I want to do what he does. So I reached out to his book publisher. I cold called his office. I sent letters in the mail, anything I could do to connect with someone who would help me get to Zig. Finally, finally, probably, <laughs> so I would stop blowing everyone up around him. His assistant scheduled a 20 minute meeting for me in Zig's office in Dallas. And, and by the way, in the interest of landing the meeting, I hadn't mentioned to his assistant that I lived in Michigan. And, and here's the thing, my greatest accomplishment at this point in my life was finishing second to be our high school commencement speaker. And by the way, <laughs> only two people tried out. So yes, I fly to Dallas, I walk into Zig's office, it's pristine, clean desk, a few family photos. And after connecting, asking questions to, to Mr. Ziegler, sharing my desire to do what he does, Zig leaned forward toward me. He leaned forward and I was ready, right? Like here comes the secret sauce. Well, Molly, first you need to go out into the world and do something. And then you can go out into the world and talk about it. I was like, wow, I mean, that's it? So yes, I flew to Dallas for Zig to tell me to go do something with my life. So, so after that, I hopped on a flight back to Lansing. And I never really thought much about speaking again. I mean, Zig was right. I needed to go out into the world and do something. So after I graduated from Michigan State, I pursued my other big passion, sports. For more than 15 years, I was a sports agent and I had a front row seat to peak performance, to the mindset of the best athletes and coaches in the world. I'm talking about all-stars, Hall of Famers, national championship coaches, Olympians, Emmy award-winning broadcasters. I mean, unbelievable at what they do. People who, by the way, don't just get there, but they stay there. People who won and won a lot. Here's the deal. You know, most of us are fascinated by greatness, aren't we? By, by the game changers who perform at the highest level, often on the biggest stages. So, so what's the difference between those who maximize their potential and those who don't? What's the difference? You think it's talent, but it's really drive. But because talent, it might get you there, sure, but drive, drive will keep you there. Talent might get you drafted, but drive will keep you and get you to the big leagues. Talent might get you out on the PGA Tour, but drive, drive is what it takes to win tournaments. Talent might win you some games, but drive, drive will win you championships. You know, in the world of pro sports, there is no place for complacency. No place for complacency because there is always someone younger, faster, stronger who can't wait to take your spot, who can't wait to take your job. Only something like, get this, 0.08% of high school athletes make it to the pros and, and that's just get there. The average pro playing career it is somewhere between three and five years, depending on the sport. So, so if you count on talent alone, sure, you might make it, but you'll only make it for a cup of coffee. You know, no one likes to talk about complacency, right? Like you probably don't wake up in the morning and say, today, I will not be complacent. Not today, complacency, no chance. <laughs> Or, or go to bed at night and think to yourself, man, today I was really complacent. I won't do that again. See, that's the issue. 
Complacency by definition is accompanied by unawareness. That, that's why it's so easy for it to, to creep in like, a, like an invasive weed, take root in your life, and then before you know it, take over. The opposite of complacency is drive. You know, most people think of drive the way that the dictionary defines it. The energy and determination to achieve things. But I think there's something missing, something missing in this definition. Sorry, Webster. <laughs> you know, to me, drive is the determination to get better every single day. Here's what I learned from the athletes who sustained success. They set the bar internally, not externally. They, they didn't worry about the guys behind them. They expected them. Heck, they welcomed them. They encouraged them. They even mentored them. Because the real magic happens when you stop, when you stop focusing on the competition against others and you start competing against yourself. Right? The best coaches, they talk about the process, the behaviors that drive the outcome they want. The greatest irony in sports is that the ones who win the most, they don't really talk about winning. When winning for the sake of winning becomes the goal, it isn't sustainable. So what do they focus on? They focus on competing, on getting better than they were yesterday. The best are driven to up their game every day. They love the parts that no one else loves, the day-to-day -day grind, the work, the effort. They don't live for the results. They live for the process. They love the pursuit. They know the view from the summit. Sure, it's nice. But the climb, that's what makes it all worthwhile. The best, the Brady's, the Kobe's, the Serena's, the LeBron's of the world, they all embrace this I've never arrived mindset. I, I saw this all firsthand for almost two decades as a sports agent. And by the way, in the sports agent industry, you'll find this interesting. There are more agents than athletes to represent. This is not a great business model. So to say it's competitive, that's an understatement. Because unless you're getting an athlete straight out of high school or college, the only way that you land a new client, the only way you land a new client is to convince them to switch agents. So it's easy, right, as an agent to focus on other agents, on the competition. But the minute that you do that, the minute that you do that is the minute that you lose focus on what matters most, which of course is over delivering for your clients and your prospective clients every day. When I started in this space, I had zero credentials, zero, zero reason on paper to be there. But what I lacked in my resume, I made up for in drive. At 24, I was hired by a small sports marketing agency to secure appearances and endorsements for our handful of clients. And I remember just months into the job, sitting on the floor at the office, and I was sort of sorting through merchandise for our clients, and I remember sitting on that floor thinking, how are we gonna grow? How are we gonna grow? How are we gonna get more clients? You know, I, I, I processed it very briefly, to be honest. And then with fearlessness and a good bit of naivety, I popped up and I walked into our leader's office. I walked in and I looked and I said, quick question. Yes, he sort of spun his chair around to, to face me. What's our growth plan? What do you mean? Well, what's our plan to sign more players? Referrals. He said really fairly confidently. That, that's how we got here. They, they, you know, our clients, they, they love us and, and, and they refer clients to us. Got it, love it, I said, but question, what if, what if we got a little bit more aggressive? I mean, we're here in Atlanta, right? Baseball's a big deal here. The Braves are here, minor league teams are close. You know, there's strong college programs right here. What if, 
What if we recruited players instead of just waiting for referrals? He sort of stared at me. I can still see it, right? Probably sort of contemplating if I had any clue what I was even talking about. Well, what if I put a business plan together to show you how we could go start with baseball, how we could go out and start to build a, a bigger baseball division? He sort of paused, he glanced out the window, he looked back up at me and he said, go for it, go for it. I mean, if, if you can figure it out, go for it. You know, I don't know if he actually believed that I could do it or if he just wanted me to stop coming into his office uninvited. All I know is that he gave me a shot. He gave me a shot. So, so day after day, I'd head down to the baseball fields at Georgia Tech. I'd lean on that fence, right? I'd lean on that fence. All the scouts were kind of all up and down the fence with stopwatches in their hands and clipboards. And they all kind of knew each other, right? They had chewing tobacco on one side of their lip and bubble gum in the other, right? So I packed a fat chew and No, I'm just kidding, I didn't do that. <laughs> Slowly but surely, I, I, I built relationships. I built relationships with the coaches, the scouts, even the parents. And, and before long, I was, I was using the, the lingo, right? I was talking about going deep, right? Sitting curveball, roping it to first. I loved, I loved the process. I loved the, the grind. I, I loved really the idea of helping an athlete capitalize on such a remarkably unique window of time in their lives. We signed a couple guys out of tech that first year and a few more the next year. I expanded my relationships to other college programs, to other minor league programs, to other markets. Some guys, of course, they'd get to the big leagues and some wouldn't. From baseball, we expanded to other sports like golf and, and college coaches. And then when our coaches would get, get fired, which of course happens, we'd find them broadcasting jobs. So a broadcaster division was born. By the time I left the agency 15 years later, I'd grown our client representation division to over 300 athletes, coaches, and broadcasters and a team of agents. Good or bad, <laughs> right or wrong, CNN dubbed me the female Jerry Maguire. If I had come into this space and tried to compare myself, to compare myself to other agents, I wouldn't be here right now. For starters, I would have looked around the field or the court or the course and I would have noticed the obvious, all men. All men and thought, I don't belong here. I was different. I was really different, but that was a good thing. I, ha I had to figure out how I could up my game every day, not compare myself. I had to find a way to be so good that prospects, they couldn't say no. And if they did, well, my philosophy, no, it's just feedback. With, with this simple mindset shift, right, setting the bar internally versus externally, the drive to achieve is replaced by something more sustainable, the drive to get better. The desire to achieve is fleeting, but the desire to get better, it's unending. Yes, the byproduct of that is usually, usually achievement, but that's not the focus. Because if it's all about achievement, the trophies, the accolades, the money, once you get them, you're done. You're done, you'll fold up like a cheap lawn chair. This is exactly, this is exactly why success breeds complacency. You know, when you drink your own Kool-Aid, <laughs> it quenches your thirst, sure. But then you lose that thirst, you lose that desire, that hunger to get better. But if it's all about raising the bar for yourself every single day, then complacency, it can't take root. It has no shot. See, the best, they don't have a rear view mirror. I remember a college coach that I represented celebrating the biggest moment of his career, his first national championship. He cut down the net, celebrated with his guys in the locker room and his staff. He teared up in the interview with the media. He enjoyed every minute of it. But I remember talking to him the very next morning. And guess what he was doing? The very next morning, he was on the phone with a top high school recruit, working on trying to lock him in to come play basketball for him next season. 
just hours, hours after an amazing season, he was already focused on getting better because that's what the best do. Because here's what they know. They know that the desire to achieve, it might get you there, but the desire to get better will keep you there. We all have a choice in life. You can, you can settle for less than, less than you're capable of, less than you deserve, less than you were meant to be, or you can go for more. As a competitive tennis player, I hit a plateau as a teenager and I, I needed to be more aggressive. I needed to get off the baseline and, and get to the net. So, so I walked out to one of my very last tennis lessons with my longtime juniors coach. He looked at me, he said, Molly, today we're gonna do something a little bit different. He said, we are gonna play sharks and minnows. Behind the baseline, he said, there's sharks. If you step back behind that line during the point, he said, you will get eaten up by the sharks. Now, I'm 17 years old, I'm headed to play D1 tennis and I'm playing sharks and minnows? But here's the thing, that lesson was a really powerful realization for me on and off the court. It's really a realization for all of us that it's about stepping in, that it's about leaning in, that it's about cutting off the angle and going for it in life every day. You know, reflecting back, why was I settling in at the baseline, right? Like, why was I settling in back there? Complacency. <laughs> I had a false sense of security. I was, I was kind of comfortable back there. But the more that I worked on stepping in and, and, and going to the net, both in practice and in matches, the better I got. So, so here's what I learned. Here's what I learned from my junior tennis coach back in Michigan and the best athletes in the world. Don't stand on the baseline of your life and accidentally become a spectator Step in between the lines. Step in between the lines and go for it. Fall in love with the pursuit of getting better. There'll be tough moments. There'll be setbacks and, and there'll absolutely be moments of self-doubt for sure. Expect it. Then find that little tug, that little tug inside of you to just be a little bit better. That's, that's where the magic happens. That's drive. Thank <laughs> you.